This is Tommy's Outdoors 137. Today we are going to talk about salmonids with a special emphasis on sea trout and about the research done on those fish as a part of Compass project. Yes, this is another episode where we talk about research done in a Compass project and this time our guest is Dr. Richard Kennedy, who is the senior science officer at AFBI. Um, mighty interesting episode, especially for those of you who enjoy a little bit of uh, angling and those of you who chase sea trout, the, the ep that episode is a must to understand better uh, that fish and also understand what's going on in the environment, what are the threats and uh, other interesting facts about sea trout and salmon is in general. And uh, folks, as usual, before I let you enjoy this episode of the podcast, just remember to subscribe to Tommy's Outdoors newsletter. The link is in the description of this show, or you can just go to newsletter.tommysoutdoors.com. I always welcome uh, any and all feedback related to those episodes. So the best way to leave the feedback is basically reply to one of the emails uh, from that newsletter. You sending you'll be sending that episode you'll be sending that email directly to my inbox and I promise I respond to every single one of those emails. So yeah, folks, uh, that's it. And now without any further delay, sea trout and salmonid fish with Dr. Richard Kennedy. Richard, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Nice to be here. Nice to get a chat with you. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, salmonid research and everything about the uh, sea trout and salmon. But before we get there, um, you know, start just to lay the things out. Could you please like introduce yourself for our listeners, who you are, what you do, what's the, what's the uh, research that you're doing? My name is, is Richard Kennedy. I, I work for AFBI, the Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, uh, and I'm one of the um, researchers there. Uh, my uh, area of uh, interest uh, is uh, looking at salmonid science, so that's looking at uh, salmon and sea trout. Uh, my day job, I will uh, spend a lot of time looking at um, data to monitor stocks. So we collect information on the status of salmon and trout stocks around Northern Ireland. We look after a network of fish counters uh, and fish traps to assess the numbers coming back, to look at their biology and so forth. We do a lot of work uh, with electrofishing uh, to look at juvenile trout and salmon in, in, in streams and rivers around Northern Ireland. So uh, I spend a lot of time looking at stocks, but uh, we also get the fantastic opportunity to do some research uh, into interesting aspects of, of, of trout and salmon, looking at their behavior, uh, looking at survival, looking at some of the issues that uh, are challenging for the managers um, who have to who have to manage the, the, the stocks and, you know, providing advice for them and so forth. So quite a mixed and, and varied role and uh, a lot to keep me out of mischief, uh, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> very good very good that's a that's a hell of an introduction and richard i have to ask are you an angler as well are you angling for these fish or are you purely on the scientific side yeah i do i do enjoy i do enjoy angling uh, I, ha I have to admit <laughs> that um I, I do spend quite a lot of time sea angling um and uh, i suppose whenever you're you're working on rivers um all the time <laughs> it's nice to do something just a little bit different so over the last sort of 10 years i've been doing a lot more sea angling than, than river fishing to be honest mm, that's perfect that's perfect i love sea angling as well so that sets scene perfectly because a lot of listeners are you know hunters and anglers and i always uh, I just just love that mix when there's a you know, like angling as so someone's an angler or hunter and also a scientist and, and kind of like a merge two worlds uh, into one. So listen, before we get into the discussion about the, the the Compass project and that part of the Compass project specifically dedicated to sea trout and salmon, um, I would like you to give our listeners very quick primer on salmonid fish. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you folks already know that, and there are other folks, you know, you, you're well aware, but probably there's a, like a person who doesn't know exactly. So if you could give us like a quick primer of a life history of a salmon fish and what are the differences between 
you know, uh, sea trout and salmon and, and, and stuff like that without going into like a massive detail, but just for people who are missing this part of like how special these, these fish are. So they, uh, on the same page. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's no problem. Um, I, I think most people are aware of, um, Atlantic salmon. Um, they're a very iconic, uh, species in, in, in the UK and Ireland and broader, um, uh, geographic, extend throughout Europe and North America. Um, so Atlantic salmon, to start off with, are what we call an anadromous fish. That is that they complete their life history in two discrete environments. So the, the, the young salmon um, grow and mature in fresh water. Uh, in Northern Ireland, most of our, our young salmon, they spend about two years in, in the river. And then in the spring time, after two, maybe three years, they um, start to get the urge to, to go to sea. Uh, and that uh, causes the fish to go through a transformation, a process we know as smultification. So it really pre-adapts the young fish for um, marine life. And those little fish then drop down their home river systems, head out into the sea, and uh, they migrate well offshore. Salmon we know are, are heading um, into the Norwegian Sea, well up into the, the, the North Atlantic, where they spend a year, maybe two years at sea, growing, maturing, getting bigger, getting um, filled with eggs if they're female fish, uh, before they return back to their natal river. Uh, to, to spawn and to reproduce the next generation uh, of young fish. They show surprising fidelity in that they come back again to the, to the very stream that they were, they were born in themselves. So, so, so Atlantic salmon have quite a, a, a widespread life, life history. They, they move vast distances. Sea trout, by contrast, um, they're similar in that uh, they, they also go to sea after two or three years. Um, they'll also spend maybe a year or more in the marine environment. But I guess the big difference between the two species is that sea trout tend to have much more localized um, um, marine migration patterns than the salmon. The salmon go hundreds of miles offshore. The sea trout tend to stick about their 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 estuary or their <coughs> the, the area that the, of the coast that their river flows in at. So they're similar, um, but they also have discrete differences uh, between the, the two species. The other thing I suppose it's important about about sea trout is that uh, trout are in the business we call them very plastic. They they can show great variability in the in the behaviours that they undertake. Some fish will stay in the river for their entire life. Others will go to sea. Um, uh, 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 and others will, will will show maybe behavior where they drop into the estuary and live there. So really um, diverse um, range of, of, of behaviors that these fish can, can undertake. So hopefully that gives a, a wee bit of a, a, an intro into the, 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 the two different species that we're interested in today. Yeah, that's perfect. Listen, uh, two, two more questions that I have like out of my own interest and probably also a clarification. The differences between salmon and sea trout, you, you touch on that behavioral, but there's also differences in, in how they look. And um, like to me, there's always like sea trout is the small one and salmon is a big one. But then there is a significant overlap in the sizes. It's just like a, the, the population of a sea trout that anglers have an opportunity to catch that it just happens there's 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 small ones so can you elaborate a little bit about like what is the the natural you know span of sizes of both fish and is it is it the the indication of the population of sea trout being in trouble that we only see those or mostly see those small ones yeah, well, I, I, I would, I would uh, debate the fact that, uh, that, that, that there would be, you know, a, a difference, you know, in size between the two species to the extent that, you know, sea trout are always smaller than salmon. We, we do see some spectacular sea trout specimens, particularly on the on 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 the east coast of um, County Down, from time to time. 
Um, some sea trout can survive surprisingly long um, periods of time. Um, we've taken scale samples from individual fish that have been uh, alive for eight or nine years um, and fish that have maybe spawned five or six times during their life. And some of these sea trout are, are, are really large, impressive animals that are bigger than some of the salmon that are returning potentially to the same river. So there is there is an overlap in, in, in the size between the, 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 the two species. By and large, um, anglers will be presented with um, uh, quite a lot of small sea trout. So we call those in the, in, in the business, we call those finnick or whittling. Those are, are, are sea trout that go to sea in the spring and then come back uh, to their home river after only a few months at liberty in the, in the sea. So those fish don't have the opportunity to grow really big. And uh, typically those those small finnick would be maybe sort of 25 centimetres up to maybe 35 centimetres. So they're, they're the typical kind of um, finnick sea trout that most anglers would be really familiar with and would, would, would commonly see. Salmon, by contrast, tend to spend at least one uh, uh, winter or one year at sea uh, and they tend to come back much larger. So their first appearance back to the river, they're, they're probably going to be at least a kilo and a half in, in weight, maybe sort of 55 centimetres long. So they're significantly bigger upon first return. But as the life history goes on and um, the sea trout survive from one year to the next to the next, the, the, the differential in size kind of flattens out a little bit and uh, you, you get some really spectacular sea trout. It's interesting because um, large uh, sea trout tend to be um, quite deep, quite heavy fish. They are spectacular to look at. Now, I haven't caught any any massive sea trout in my life, but I hear that you know to hook a double figure sea trout is 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 a experience to 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 behold. Oh, wow. So um, you know, yeah, there's 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 overlap, but there's similarities um, uh, between the two species. But um, I, I wouldn't say size was everything. Yeah, yeah, no, that's you're you're right. Yeah, I usually uh, I usually catch sea trout when I'm fishing for bass in the estuary, and then you know small finnock, like you said, uh, this is this is uh, you know uh, it's usually bycatch for me. I, I seldom kind of target uh, sea trout. But anyway, um, there's also this thing with the notch on the on the tail, right? One has it, one doesn't. Is that is that a reliable way to to tell sea trout from salmon if you catch the big fish? Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, there are some there are some key differences between the two species. The the salmon tends to have more of a fork in the tail. Um, there, there there tends to be slight difference in the in the spotting patterns between the the two species. Um, the sea trout has a, a slightly different position of its eye in relation to the maxillae, the the, the upper lip. Um, there is a difference in the in, in, in the uh, fins of the fish as well. The pectoral fin tends to be larger in Atlantic salmon, slightly smaller in, in, in sea trout. So, you know, there, there are quite a few a few giveaways between the two species. One of the one of the old um, ways that. Uh, some of the old gillies used to talk about was that if you could lift the fish by the tail, it was probably a salmon. Uh, if you couldn't, it was more likely to be a be a sea trout. Um, so yeah, I think I think it, it, it's 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 perhaps even more difficult sometimes in the juvenile fish, and certainly when we're electrofishing um, streams and, and rivers, we need to be able to identify between the two species, and um, you know we would be working our way through those. Um, identification um, characteristics to, to, to make sure we get it right every time. So, yeah, it can be a challenge at times, particularly in, particularly in smaller fish and juveniles. Yeah. And what about big fish? So this is like a, just to finish off that, that section, but, uh, you know, I'm sure that a lot of anglers are listening to that with interest. So if you, are there fish that has display the, the, the um, qualities of, you know, kind of one and the other. So, is there is there a situation where big fish is genuinely hard to identify, 
Or is it like if someone is like professional like you, you will just, you know, 100 times out of 100 will tell exactly whether it's sea trout or, or, or salmon? Or are there like a kind of like a edge cases almost where it's like, ah, oh, you know, I'm not sure about that? Yeah. I mean, I mean, mo- mo- most, t- to be honest, I, I would be very confident in a, that in a large mature adult, we'd be able to tell the two apart. There is one circumstance, however, that e- even those of us with, with a lot of experience can struggle. Um, and that's because occasionally the two species can hybridize. Yeah. And you do get the odd fish that um, probably has a salmon mother and, and a trout father. Um, some of these fish go to sea. Um, and the, the only really reliable way of, of, of telling a hybrid is to um, look at its genetic profile. Um, and then we can we can we can pick it out as such. But um, it, it does happen. It's it's unusual. Um, but, but it does happen, and we have seen a number of these uh, fish in, in Northern Ireland over the over the years. Yeah, I remember like last year, or was it two years ago, there was a big storm on Facebook, a, a, a big fish caught, and it was like, no, it's a salmon, no, it's not salmon. It's like, like, it was like a big, big, massive discussion, what is it? So uh, that that explains that it, it might have been hybrid, and that's why it was... Uh, having uh anyway listen okay so i think we 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 uh pretty much covered like what we what is the fish we're going to talk about here and now i'm going to switch gears and would like to talk about compass project and the research so if you can tell us you know how the what was the what was the design of this study what your you know how how this work package came to be so what was the motivation what were the goals, uh, you know, objectives that you set for this project and, you know, how, how that was uh, decided and how the whole uh, work started? One of the main um, drivers behind Compass was to look at the life history of um, salmon and sea trout in the sea. We've got lots of um, information about juvenile fish, even adult fish in fresh water. They're easier to study in fresh water. Uh, we know a lot about their biology, but we were keen with the Compass uh, project to look at the um, behavior, the movements of fish, the return rates of fish f- uh, into and back from, from the ocean. Um, but one of the main motivations, I guess, at uh, trying to, to, to gain more data from both salmon and sea trout in, in, in the marine environment is that things have changed markedly for the fish over the last sort of 30, 40 years. I'll give you an example of that. Um, we uh, monitor the marine survival of Atlantic salmon at the Riverbush Salmon Station. So we, we, we count all the young fish heading out to sea and then we count all the adults coming back. Now, if you reverse in time back to the 1980s, for every 100 young smolts, salmon smolts that left the river, you would have expected to see maybe 20 to 30 of those fish back again as adults to the coast. Now, in those days, that was kind of the, you know, that was a standard return rate. So you got about 20 to 30% marine survival. In the last sort of maybe two decades, that number has really badly declined. And, um, you know, from every hundred young fish that we would uh, see heading out now, we're lucky to see four or five back. So something remarkable has happened in the ocean um, that has led to uh, a big reduction in in survival of these uh, species of fish uh, at sea. And Compass um, was a really good opportunity for us to get a little bit more detailed information uh, on on, on salmon, more so on sea trout, to see where they were going, looking at their spatial distributions um, uh, around the coast and into the sea and looking at um, some of the the, um, early marine influences that may may be impacting them. So that's kind of where the motivation of, of, of the Compass project came from. Mm. So to see what's what's happening in the in the sea, and tell me what the what were the techniques that you're used for monitoring fish? Because when you when you you know talking like a you know in the layman terms, like how on earth would you monitor a fish that goes in the ocean and then like whoa, what's how is it even possible? Yeah, well, I mean, 
20, 30 years ago, it would have been much more difficult. In fact, we probably wouldn't have been able to do the things that we can do now. Um, most of the research that was conducted um, uh, by Compass used uh, acoustic telemetry. So we were using um, a tagging system to monitor movements of fish from fresh water out into the sea. Um, that involved um, tagging the fish with a small electronic tag. So the little tag has um, a discrete uh, code that it uh, pings out at regular intervals. That code is uh, an acoustically kind of transmitted code, so it, it transmits out through the water. Um, and what we do then is we have a number of receivers, acoustic receivers set at uh, strategic positions through the river and out into the coast and further offshore as well to monitor for any of those fish that, 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 that come within range. So we can, we can collect the receivers in at the end of the project and we can see which fish have been detected where. That gives us a lot of information in terms of, the, of timing of movements. Um, what we call phenology in the in, 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 in the science, so we can understand the migratory um, movement patterns in time, also in space, so we know when the fish are, are moving, when they're moving, where they're moving. Um, we get some information on how many are actually making it out to, to, to key points. Um, and in the case of the sea trout, we were able then to track fish back again to the river after they had been uh, to, to sea. So we, we, we were trying to kind of fill in some um, information gaps, I guess, on on this kind of black box, which is the marine environment. It's so difficult to, to, to study fish within. Hmm. Remarkable. How close the, the fish has to be to the receiver to be registered? Yeah, so so that's that's dependent on a couple of things. Um, acoustic signals do transfer really well through water, um, so 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 the range is is considerable in good conditions. So if you have um, a tag in a in a in a small smolt, that tag tends to be smaller than than the tag you would put into an adult. Adults obviously bigger and can carry a higher higher tag size, but the small tags typically you might get within freshwater 100 meters away, um, which is adequate for, you know, most of our small coastal rivers, you know, you can, you can cover quite a bit of range with that. Once you get into the sea, the range can extend in flat, calm conditions whenever there's not a lot of noise about, whenever it's not too turbulent. Um, the, the signal we've had, picked up a signal at maybe a range of 400 meters away from the from the actual fish. So, you know, the range is considerable. And um, when you consider that we've got networks of receivers with overlapping fields, you know, you, you can have fairly good efficiencies in terms of the pickups of fish in in, in, in key locations throughout the, the, the study and the, the study area. Hmm. And you're able to say how far the fish is once once the receiver receives the signal. I presume there's a, there's a, the algorithm that can say like, okay, that fish is very close or it's further away. There's all sorts of things you can do with the data. You know, if you've got a good network of receivers, you can triangulate position between them, and you can you know you can you can do lots of, lots of lots of very fancy science. Um, we were. Uh, the, the main thrust of, of our work in Compass was to look at timing, to see when our smolts are, are going, when's the peak movement into the tide, um, how many of them are making it through the lower rivers, into the estuaries, from the estuary then to the coastal areas uh, and further afield. Um, so, so, so we were answering some questions about timing, about survival, um, about movement patterns and, and, and migratory behavior in these key kind of transitional areas, the areas that we're, you know, we were lacking data on, these areas that potentially can be quite dangerous for young fish when they're having to run a gauntlet of, of, of larger fish or birds or mammals that potentially can eat them. Um, because 
predators aren't aren't um, aren't stupid. They they know when there is an availability of of, of a food source, and they will they will aggregate around um, you know uh, migrations like any like any predator. You know they're opportunistic. So you know we, we were we were trying to, to to get a handle on on the um, survival and biology of the our, our target species. Particularly in these key kind of um, hypothetical bottlenecks. And how many receivers were like in, in total the, in in that network? Oh, um, I think we had for the sea trout work. We had so we had a number of rivers that we we tagged fish in. We tagged fish um, in the Shimna River, and uh, we tagged some fish up on Strangford Loch in Northern Ireland. Now in Compass, we work very closely with with colleagues in Inland Fisheries Ireland, um, on on the east coast of Ireland. So our colleagues down there, they were tagging fish in a couple of rivers as well. They worked on the Castletown River uh, in Louth, and they also worked down in the Boyne. They tended to tag sea trout in the Castletown and uh, and salmon uh, down on the Boyne River. So we we had maybe four um, sort of study rivers that we were tagging in. And each one of those would have had at least maybe four, half a dozen receivers uh, through the lower portion and into the estuary. And then we had a network um, of, uh, we probably had maybe sort of 40 plus receivers at sea spread along the, the, the coast. Um, and then we, 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 for a couple of years of the project, we had a, an array of receivers set between Scotland and Ireland to pick up salmon moving uh, northwards out of the Irish Sea and up into the uh, the Atlantic. So I think there were maybe 22 receivers deployed in a, in a line between between Scotland and Ireland for that. So it was a significant network over the, 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 the years of the Compass project, significant numbers of receivers and a lot of information um, to be sifted through to, to you know, to get the get the information from that array of, um, of equipment. Yeah. And they were on the on the boys? And yeah, so we, we 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 used different um, arrangements for for different locations. So um, in the deep sea areas um, through you know Beaufort's Dyke, the deep area between um, Scotland and Ireland, it's too deep really to you know put a, 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 a leave a buoy on the surface and a couple of hundred meters of rope down to the seabed. So what we did there was we used. Um, smart receivers which had an acoustic release and these units um, can be basically sunk down to the seabed um, you've no float um, at the surface they have a bit of buoyancy built into the to the receiver unit and whenever the uh, receiver is recovered um, it's a matter of going out by ship um, using a, a communication box and then you pop the receiver back up it automatically releases itself from the seabed and floats back up so that we can recover it so you know it means that you can deploy um, receivers in deep water maybe in shipping lanes places where a boy wouldn't wouldn't stick or would get cut off or would be a risk to, to, to shipping so deep sea deployments were, were, were a little bit different inshore deployments we we tended to work around um, you know existing infrastructure if there was a boy there that we could tie off on or we else we put our own mooring down with a boy you know in the, in the inshore areas and then obviously rivers are slightly different so we had receivers there uh usually sort of hidden in um the river bed um different ways that we would, we would have put the put the receiver in and uh yeah so 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 a range of deployment methods really uh, depending on the um the habitat that the receiver had to go into so we had to be quite inventive through the project to to, to get them all in there's a this is quite uh i mean i'm i'm blown away this is kind of like a very technical very uh advanced technology used for that with the with the receivers that can just release itself and then flow to the there there so yeah i presume this is like a significant amount of money uh went into the the equipment itself is it like someone makes this type of receivers this equipment or is it was it uh made specifically for the project 
you know, so so acoustic telemetry has become a very popular um, uh, technology for fishery scientists and people interested in mobile uh, aquatic uh, organisms to, to 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 use. So there are uh, suppliers of um, telemetry tags and receiver systems out there who have good products that that, that cover. Uh, a range of, uh, of of needs and requirements. So you know, I mean, we we didn't have to invent, <laughs> you know, the, uh, the the equipment, but we did have to be able to adapt it to the conditions that we were working in. Um, we did have to be able to sort of um, figure out how to get our networks uh, in place, how to keep those networks alive over the winter time when we had gales and storms coming in. You know, that that's. You know, there's a lot of effort has to go into that, and we we were very fortunate that we were able to work in some circumstances with some of the local fishermen, um, some of the commercial um, lobster fleet are, are very knowledgeable about inshore areas in particular and what sort of gear is going to stick it and, and what you know good locations to secure a, um, a mooring to the to the seabed you know these sorts of things so we were able to avail of a lot of a lot of expertise out there a lot of goodwill from not only the angling communities you know in relation to the rivers but also from from sort of the inshore fishing uh, community as well that, that give us a good a good help in, in many of these areas Hmm. Good. Glad. Glad to hear. Glad, glad to hear that there was like this sort of a collaborative effort and a, and a sharing of a knowledge and information. How long that network was was running? How many years? So we 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 kicked off Compass. Now I think it was about two thousand and eighteen. We 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 did the first uh, taggings in um, the Shimna. Our colleagues in IFI also tagged on the Castle Town and the Boyne in that in that year. So that kind of kicked us off. So we had networks running uh, from 2018 through to 2021. Um, with the, the the COVID year, we had we had some activity, but we were um, restricted a little bit in 2020 in terms of what we could do. The lockdowns kind of kicked in in the spring that year, whenever the smolts were were running. So that that kind of put a bit of a a delay on some of the work, but we, we kept, we had a skeleton uh, amount of, of, of network still available in, in, in 2020 as well, which kind of kept us in business. Um, and, and then 2021, we, we, we kind of finished off the, the, the last of the tagging in that year. So it was, it was a good, um, a good multi-year effort between our, ourselves and our colleagues in, in IFI. Um, yeah. So it was a, you know, enough time to get some good signals from the from the data. Yeah, but like you said, even operationally, keeping that network running from a technical standpoint, you know, dealing with the breakages and all that, I'm, I'm sure there was a a lot of fun with that. Um, Richard, so now we we talk about the receivers. Now let's talk about those tags. So the first question that I'm really curious about is: Are those tags impact the fish? Are there are there impact behavior of the fish and and are those those detachable tags or is this tag with the fish forever and ever? How does that work? Yeah. Okay. So uh, th there are different ways that you can theoretically attach a tag to a fish. Um, you can attach a, a tag that trails from the fish. You know, attach it to a fin or. Or put a fly tag into its into its back, or you know, there's 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 a number of ways you can put a cradle on. We we tend not to do that, um, particularly for long term studies, because um, whenever you attach anything to the surface of a fish, it interferes with its swimming ability, its ability to do the things it needs to do. So the work that uh, we undertook, we used a implantation technique so the tag was surgically implanted into the fish and implanted into its body cavity so it's a small um, surgical procedure the the tag is implanted into the peritoneal cavity it's a, basically the body cavity um, um, a suture is made to seal up the, the the wound the fish is allowed to recover um, and uh, once it's recovered, then it's, it's released. Um, once the tag's inside, it's a fairly small tag. 
Um, we always make sure that the tag burden is not um, a problem for the fish. So, you know, you're using the correct size fish um, to take any particular type of tag. Um, so we have size thresholds that we, we, we have to stick to, to 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 ensure the welfare of the animal. Um, I, I would say that uh, many of the animals that we've tagged previously have come back as adults carrying their tag. They have the tag for life. Um, it... Um, you know, does not inhibit them in any way coming back, uh, maturing, coming back to spawn, developing, and so forth. Um, the work is also done on both jurisdictions under a strict animal welfare uh, legislation. We have licenses. We are inspected regularly, and um, the work's done to the highest welfare standards that we can we can do. I mean, if if you think about it, these tags are are expensive. Um, we want the fish to be as as lively and as healthy as possible after the tagging. We, we don't want to compromise it. We want to ensure that that fish goes about its behaviour in as natural uh, a way as, as as possible. And I think we've been able to do that uh, through the protocols that we, we, we've set up. So the fish has the tag for life, and uh, that gives us tremendous opportunities to gain lots of data through the the, 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 the the rest of that fish's um, journey through the sea and, and back to the river again. Mm, man, I wish I, I caught a fish with a tag one day. <laughs> you got to be careful not to break your teeth or something, right? You, when, <laughs> when you decided to take that fish home and you're good, it's like, oh, what is this thing? I would like if people, if, if, if anyone catch that uh, sea turtle or, or salmon and find a tag inside, what, she, what is this tag? useless and throw it to the bin or like put it on your trophy shelf like oh this is tag i found in the fish or is it useful to return it to yeah uh, ab absolutely i mean i mean the tags are small they're, they're they're only seven millimeters in diameter so it's not a big thing and to, to be honest i would say most anglers if they had got a, a fish after they landed, the tag would be gone, and they maybe wouldn't even know that you know it was there. But if if somebody did happen to come across a tag, there's a little um, a, a identification sticker on the tag, um, which uh, would allow them to see the ID code and so forth. And it would not take very long um, to to get in touch with us. Uh, let us know about that. We would love to know. Um, it would just be a matter of contact in your, your local fishery uh, authority, whether north of the border, south of the border. Anyone within the you know the the, the business would be able to very rapidly um, let us know about that. So yeah, any any anybody who comes across a tag, please do get in touch with the Republic IFI in Northern Ireland. Contact with. Um, uh, Deer Inland Fish, and uh, we'll we'll certainly we'll certainly let you know all about that fish and where your fish has been to and what it's been been up to prior to capture. It is, this is great, right? You you know, like all those anglers. I I never I was never lucky enough to catch a fish with a tag, but I know like a lot of folks who either caught a shark or a bass with a tag, and then there's like amount of excitement that generates like oh look at this fish you know it was stuck there and it was weighing this much and, and so and so and like it's, it just gives you that whole history that you wouldn't know otherwise um richard tell me how's the tagging look like so is 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 tagging uh are you relying you you probably cannot rely on anglers uh, I, I was involved in the bass sea bass uh tagging i shouldn't say sea bass bass tagging pro i heard of the sea bass is like a culinary industry it talks about sea bass so bass and shark tags um where these programs rely on anglers uh and and recreational uh fish being caught by recreational anglers but i presume with the surgical procedures and everything that you described that's impossible so how how did you go about tagging those fish and how many fish were tagged in the, in the process during the program well, I, yeah, I wouldn't underestimate the the um, input that anglers um, or minimise the input that anglers have 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 have, have given. Um, so certainly, our project under Compass, we were really reliant on anglers to actually. Oh, really? Supply. Yeah, we, we were um, on, on the on the county down rivers. I think most of our 
smoked samples were caught by anglers. So we would have had a we would have had a you know a day where we had organised with the the local club, a couple of volunteers. They would have gone out and and, and fly fished. Smolts, uh, particularly young trout and uh, salmon smolts, gather up in large numbers um, before they run to sea. Um, they can be readily captured on rod and line. Sometimes it's more um, appropriate to catch them on rod and line, perhaps if they're in a deeper area of the river that's harder to get in and do electrofishing in, or if you don't have a, a fish trap operational on a particular river, angling is a very convenient and, and a very um, easy way to, uh, easy on the fish to, 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 to capture a sample. So yeah, we, we, we used the rod caught fish uh, and gathered up samples on, on our tagging days. Um, we then took them to the tag site uh, where they were um, individually tagged um, uh, and then released. So, yeah, I mean... I so, mean that, I so that's the question I have because you, you said that there, there was like a surgical procedure. So I couldn't imagine angler doing a surgical no, no, procedure no, 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 on that fish. No, 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 definitely not. No, no the, the, the anglers would have supplied us with the sample of fish and then we would have we would have done the tagging ourselves. So the fish would have been brought to us in a in a, in a big oxygenated bin of, of water. Ah, uh, okay. So so so, they, so so the anglers went about the hard business of actually catching them <laughs> for <laughs> us, and uh, we just had to do the we just had to do the tagging, but we had the easier bit, you know. Gotcha. Um, so yeah, so, so so the anglers were really um, really important um, to, to to our efforts under Compass. Um, we also caught fish uh, using electrofishing. Uh, we we got some in traps as well, but but angling was a was a very important uh, mm -hmm. aspect to the project. I'm so chuffed to hear that. Um, I I'm you know I'm always you know team anglers, and it's good to hear that. Yeah, so that that was pretty cool. So they actually were instead of releasing the fish, they were putting them in into the you know quote unquote bucket i presume that was more sophisticated than just a bucket and then brought to you guys and then you do your your thing allow the fish to recover and then release with the tags yeah 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 and it's a much more efficient way of doing it because it means that you can you can get a good sample size you know if you have two or three good anglers they can cover you know a, a, a good portion of the habitats that the fish might be holding up in you know and then they can collaborate together and yeah, it's 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 a. I think it's a it's an important way. But one 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 caveat I would put to that is that um, the technique has to be a sensitive technique, particularly if you're looking for fish that you, you you're going to tag and um, you know they're going to have to 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 be uh, put through a you know a, a tagging situation. You 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 want to ensure that the fish are captured in as sensitive a way as possible. So, I mean, any fish that we uh, used from anglers were caught via fly fishing with barbless hooks. You know, and they were they were they were they were treated really carefully. Um, you know, landed quite quickly before they became exhausted um, and, and then brought rapidly to us. So, you know, we would have been, we would have been using a very, very sensitive angling uh, method to, to, <clears throat> to sample these fish for the, for the project. Okay. So now it's a excellent moment to, to ask you about some advice for anglers about fish handling technique. So if you could uh, give us your recommendation, you know, starting maybe with a fishing technique, and then once you hook up the fish, what is the best practice then and what is the best handling practice for the fish? Yeah, well, cer certainly um, for salmonids, uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence out there and there, there, are, there have been scientific papers uh, written and published uh, looking at um, the, the, the efficacy of different um, techniques. I think it's 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 well known now that fly angling is quite an easy method um, on fish. If you wish to catch and release a fish, fly angling is a is a particularly sensitive method. Um, particularly if you can combine that with barbless hooks, smallish barbless hook um, is, is is a good way to go. Um, Lure fishing is another popular method that anglers use. Lure fishing, you can also release fish from, um, but I would suggest that, you know, again, barbless hooks 
would be would be the way forward and cutting down the number of hooks on a lure um, is also useful instead of maybe you know pulling a, a lure through with a treble hook cut that down to a single barbless hook and you really massively increase the survivability of the fish uh, after capture um, bait angling probably comes further down the list it's more likely the fish is going to gorge the bait take it down deep um, and, and you're going to cause bleeding or perhaps lasting harm perhaps more appropriate if um, you're, you're taking a fish for the table um, or if you're allowed to 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 retain a fish from whatever fishery it is you're, 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 you're looking at. So, um, yeah, yeah, I would say there's probably a hierarchy of methods there with, with some being more sensitive than others. And again, you know, the handling of the fish once it's hooked, you know, uh, landing net, wet hands, um, uh, minimize the amount of time the fish is, is, is in the air and outside of the water, giving it plenty of time to recover. Um, I know, Tommy, you're talking about bass fishing, and, and, and certainly uh, it's a, um, a form of angling I enjoy. And I know I've, 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 I've caught a couple of bass in the past, which, you know, have looked as though they've been sort of a bit, you know, slow to recover, but given enough time, you know, they, they did recover and swam off strongly. So I think taking your time with the recovery as well gives the fish a chance to, you know, uh, get its full strength back and to, uh, to recuperate. Hmm. Good. Thanks for that. That's a, that's a, that's a good advice. Uh, keep them wet, wet hands, barbless hooks, singles when possible when lure fishing. Um, these are, these are kind of like a, uh, very good advice. Okay. Uh, Richard, so that was the, uh, we talked about the program. So what was the, the, in terms of results, um, you know, you probably, it would be, we could spend another two hours talking about the results and everything and data that you gathered. But if you can hit us with a few of the highlights, um, something that you are either particularly proud of or something that, you know, surprised you or the team that you didn't expect uh, the results that you get, if, if you can give us like some of the, yeah, yeah. like a tasty bits. <laughs> well, okay. Well, we'll, we'll give you some of the highlights then, Tommy. Um, and we'll start possibly with, with salmon. Um, and I have to give a lot of credit to our colleagues in IFI here, in Inland Fisheries Ireland, because they did a lot of work on, on the salmon end uh, within Compass Project. Um, one of the, the, the key things that we wanted to find out from Compass was um, the early migratory um, direction of salmon leaving rivers from the east coast of Ireland. So we didn't know whether salmon, when they left the Boyne or the Shimna River or any of these rivers on the east coast of Ireland, whether they headed north up through the, the North Channel and into the Atlantic that way, or whether they actually turned south and went around the south coast of Ireland uh, and headed out to the um, to the Atlantic that, that, that way, or whether there was a mixture of, of, of behaviors going on. Now, something as simple as that, we, we actually didn't know, uh, and the project has given us the detections that we needed to, to, to make a conclusion. So we know now that these fish are actually moving north. We know as well that they're moving quite rapidly um, and that they're moving away from the coast and out into the, the deeper waters as quickly as they can. So the salmon seem to be on a real mission to get deep, um, as fast as possible and north as fast as possible. Um, we, we were surprised at the ground speed that some of these small fish were, were showing day after day, you know, swimming speeds maybe in excess of 20 kilometers a day, which is incredible for a fish that's maybe only 15 centimeters long. You know, that, that, that would be the equivalent of you probably running the length of Ireland every day for a month, you know. <laughs> So, you, you know, they're, they're remarkable. And, and I mean, that, that, that was, it was lovely to be able to pick up some, some, some detections from our, our little salmon as they headed north. Uh, we got some bonus detections from colleagues working on different species who had receivers out. I think we had pickups from the north coast. Uh, we had pickups uh, as well in the, on, on the west coast of Scotland. So we got some uh, fish picked up considerable distances away from from their home rivers uh, we were able to work out the ground speed that they were going at so yeah i think salmon surprised us uh, at their speed at their tenacity 
Um, and um, we, we've, we've got some lovely, lovely data now on describing East Coast uh, Irish salmon stocks, where they go, how many get out. Um, we, we noticed that um, some years survival is better than others. Uh, the, the data analysis into that is continuing to see if we can identify the main factors that are, are controlling smoke survival. And hopefully you'll hear more about that in, in the future. There is, I think there's been a paper, a scientific paper published on the salmon um, from the project. Uh, I don't know whether we could put a link to that at the end. Yeah, I was I was thinking that on your ResearchGate profile, there's a lot of uh, papers and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really bad with those papers because I'm just keep adding them to the queue to read and uh, that queue is going only one direction and I'm catching up on those papers but for sure we're going to put the links in a in a show notes so everybody who's interested in that uh can go in there and download the papers and, and read them mm -hmm. yeah so so that, that that I suppose were the highlights in terms of the salmon um the the other species that we're really interested in were, were sea trout we've already been talking a little bit about about sea trout biology um, but we, we had a number of, of really good um, novel um, outcomes from, from the sea trout work. One of those was that um, the sea trout smolts that we tagged uh, surprised us in terms of their behavior. There was, a, there was a diversity of behaviors in the young fish when they went to sea. Some fish stayed relatively close to the river mouth. We kind of expected that's what we thought would happen that they would they would all stay quite local and not move too far away that's kind of the classic thought on on young sea trout but we found that some fish actually defied our expectations and moved considerable distances up and down the east coast of ireland we had a fish where well, we had we had several fish that were tagged originally uh, on the shimna river in newcastle and county down which left um the Shimna headed into the Irish Sea, and unlike the salmon, they went south, headed south further down into the Irish Sea, down past Newry, down past Carlingford Loch, down past uh, Dun Dundalk, and headed up into the Boyne River. So we had um, we had some sea trout actually leaving their home river and visiting other rivers on the east coast of Ireland. Uh, and that that's that is of great interest not only for scientists and for anglers but also for managers because you know you could have fish being produced in one river turning up in another river quite a distance away and potentially being exposed to um, fishing effort in, in 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 the area that it's visiting so it, it goes to show that these these stocks on the east coast of Ireland, are, are, are moving they're very dynamic fish from one system are moving into another system so if you're out you know when you manage to catch a sea trout and and uh, you have to keep in mind that that fish may not even be from that river it may be visiting from another one so you may be um, when you put it back catch and release it you may be helping out somebody else's stock um, um, rather than just your own so yeah we saw uh, lots of, of fish showing showing these kind of movements and cross jurisdictional movements the other really interesting thing we saw was that um, there seems to be a relationship between the size of the fish and its survivability going forward some of the 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 the, the, the bigger fish that we tied had significantly greater chance of surviving and coming back again than the smaller fish um, and whether that is something to do with their ability to um, evade predators, bigger fish having you know higher swimming speeds, whether it's because they can get to feeding areas more readily, whether they have more resources to sustain themselves until they get to a feeding area, we, we don't know yet. We can only speculate, but I think that's a quite an important result um, because it means that the quality of the fish that leave our rivers is probably linked to the to the return that we'll see from them in the future hmm. yeah that's very interesting and and like i said uh we're gonna link papers uh that that are available and i presume there's more more papers coming as well uh, still yeah. you, I, I presume you you gathered so much data that it's uh for a few years to come uh mm -hmm. you have stuff to yeah. analyze yeah. 
So that the, I think there's a couple of papers. There's, there's one out in salmon. There's one out on sea trout as well. Sea trout behaviour, survival, um, and we're due to have you know more papers coming out over the over the next next years as well. So that that's a good way just to kind of track the track the outcomes of the the, the project is to watch the publications as as and when they come out. Yeah. That's perfect. Uh, Richard, we're going to be wrapping this thing up. Uh, I have a few like a more general questions uh, for you just to close this off. And I would like to, you know, ask you a question uh, that I don't know whether you're comfortable in answering that question or not, but I would like to know your opinion on uh, salmon farming and impact on salmon farms on the wild stocks. Um, yeah, I'm just going to leave it here and, and let you elaborate. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's been there's been um, a number of studies that have been conducted. Um, those studies are a matter of public record that have have linked um, uh, various negative issues of uh, of aquaculture against um, against wild trout, sea trout, and salmon stocks. Um, I, I think anglers are very well aware. Of the dangers of aquaculture, of sea lice, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so, so I, I think I mean there are there are dangers. It's like everything else. Um, there needs to be strong management uh, measures in place to ensure that wild stocks are safeguarded. Um, that comes down to the management of individual sites, the location of sites, planning. Uh, and so forth. There's all sorts of, of, of things go into into the uh, mix there. One of the interesting things about our work in Compass was that we have um, undertaken our work in an area that is devoid and free of aquaculture. So it gives a, a nice kind of background, natural um, picture in terms of behavior, movement, survival. And I think that will be valuable for other scientists you know who who might be be studying sea trout stocks in, in areas that have um, more impacts than than, than than our area had. Yeah, and compare the results and see. That's very good. Listen, finally, um, we all know. We I'm saying like we all know, but uh, like people who are interested in nature and especially fish stocks anglers, we know that in general. And feel free to disagree with that statement, but I don't think you will. That in general, salmon and sea trout are in trouble. You you said at the beginning of the show that the survivability took a nose dive. Um, the amount of fish that we see, the returns, and uh, people who are, keep track on the news and the you know the stocks, not only on this side of Atlantic, but also in 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 Canada and in, in in the US are are well collapsing. I'm not. <laughs> afraid to use that word so tell me what is uh in your opinion what is the future of of salmon of sea trout do you think that we you know we're gonna lose them one way or another or you see the you know light at the end of the tunnel like is some chance for this fish to survive and be enjoyed for by future generation how how do you see that playing out <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I do agree. I think that there have been declines, particularly in Atlantic salmon. Um, I think there's a lot of work going forward trying to understand the um, the causal mechanisms behind those declines uh, in the high sea. I think that those of us in the scientific community have a lot of work to do to try and understand that more. Um, one, one thing I would say is that nature in general is very adaptable. Um, you, you know, often species can uh, over time find a way. Um, salmon have a remarkable ability to persist um, given half a chance. Um, uh, salmon have the ability to, you know, I wouldn't say alter, but they, they, they have different life history strategies that they can, they can adopt. Some fish go to sea for a year as grills. We know that a lot of those fish end up in the Norwegian Sea from our locality. Other fish stay at sea for longer, maybe two sea winters. And we know some of these fish will be uh, located in different portions of the Atlantic. The two sea winter fish, for example, are of a great tendency to show up at Greenland. So it means that in the future, if conditions get better or improve, maybe 
for example, in Greenland, perhaps we might see more uh, two sea winter and older fish coming back to our rivers, and maybe maybe nature will find a balance whereby if one um, uh, age class isn't doing so well, the other may compensate for that uh, over time. So, so I, I, you know, I have to keep a little bit optimistic that um, you, you know things aren't all doom and gloom. The, the, the other thing I would say is that um, we we can't control what happens at sea. The sea's a massive place, and you know, you know, if, if climate change is impacting on it, we all have a cumulative responsibility to to help towards that. But we can manage fresh water. And I think one of the key things for trout and for salmon stocks is to ensure that um, through lobbying and through, you know, being involved in angling clubs and, you know, community groups and so forth, that our water quality is protected in, in, in streams and rivers. Um, and that uh, the habitat that the fish need is um, protected and uh, where possible enhanced so that we can uh, maximize the number of young fish that are available to go to sea um, to ensure that we have then the, the maximum numbers recruiting so that we get some back again to keep the stocks kind of ticking over. So I think there are things that we can do. There are things that are more challenging, um, uh, but I have to stay positive that, um, you know, in a hundred years time, we'll still have stocks of Atlantic salmon and, and sea trout to, to enjoy. Uh, on rotten line. Excellent. I I, I I love a little bit of the optimism. Uh, Richard, thank you for that. It's been pleasure and very educational. Uh, appreciate your time. No problem. No problem. Nice to speak to you.